Before we begin this Microsoft Digital event, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work throughout Australia, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people viewing this event today. We pay our respects to Elders both past, present and emerging, and recognise and celebrate their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Our reverence also extends to all First Nation and Indigenous peoples, as well as their ancestral lands. Hi everybody and welcome back to New Breakpoint. After a short break, it's really cool to be back. Today's episode, we're going to look at event-driven architectures and asynchronous communications and the benefits that they bring to distributed systems that we're increasingly seeing uh, in the cloud world. As always, uh, the show is all about helping you understand and answer your questions. So if you do have any questions, make sure to use the Q&A box uh, in Teams to put your questions uh, into the presenter today. Um, and the best questions or the more complicated questions we'll get to during a live Q&A at the end of the show. So please do stick around for that. Uh, if you are looking for further information about the content that's presented today, we'll put follow-up links uh, into the chat window at the end of the episode. And if you want to share the video uh, and the contents from today's session uh, with your colleagues or your community, keep an eye on your inbox as you'll receive an email over the next couple of days that will have the information you'll need to be able to do that. All right, today's show, I'm going to be joined by Amit, who's an account technology strategist for Microsoft here in Australia. Uh, this topic that he's going to be covering, um, I think if you've been working in the cloud space and you've been looking at things like serverless technology, uh, event grid uh, style applications, then event driven architectures will be something that you'll be all too familiar with. Having said that, event driven architecture is not necessarily a new topic. Uh, and I'm sure Amit's going to dig deep into that during his session today uh, and answer any common questions that you might have. So I know you're all here for the, the, main, the main show. So let's get Amit on. We'll have a quick chat and then we're into the demo. All right, now I'm joined uh, by Amit. Welcome to New Breakpoint, Amit. Thanks, Simon. It's great to be here. Did you want to tell folks out there a little bit about the role that you have at Microsoft uh, and a little bit about the topic today before we get started? Yep, absolutely. So, so at Microsoft, I, I work with with a patch of our client and partners, and and really working with them around, you know, how to utilize, you know, the awesomeness of of Microsoft Azure. Um, you know, there, there's a lot, of, you know, with in any cloud provider, and there's there's you know definitely you know better ways to use them, better ways to use their services, not as good ways. And it's really about working with the clients and partners um, to to make sure that you know we're meeting their their kind of medium and longer term business goals. Mm -hmm. And do you see uh, event driven as a, a hot topic across that group of group of folks that you work with? Absolutely. Um, you know, especially as uh, distributed services uh, and microservices have grown and grown, there, there, there's kind of uh, inherent compl complexity, which which I'll go into a little bit in in my talk um, around you know when you're when with microservices and distributed services and one way to address those uh, complexities is event driven architectures but there, there's as with any sort of uh, um, architectural decision there's always a trade off you know it, you know things in some ways become even more complex um, with event driven architectures but but you know in my view you know more more resilient and, and a bit easier to manage all right fantastic it sounds exciting um, i don't need to be here for you to do an amazing job uh, for this show I will be back a bit later uh, for the Q&A session. So folks, uh, please hang around. Amit, um, good luck and I will see you later. So as I mentioned with Simon, you know, this talk will be about event driven architectures and it's, it, you know, I, I take a bit of a history on, you know, how we got to now and, and why event driven architectures are important and some of the different uh, styles of event driven architectures um, because there, there's, as with any architectural decision, there's trade-offs and there's pros and cons. Um, so getting right into it. Um, so just a, a, a quick intro is, um, you know, dis distributed service and microservices architectures are very popular at the moment. Um, you know, there's always these discussions around microservices versus monoliths and, and, and the like, um, but they add a lot of complexity, right? And they definitely do address some very important um, kind of architectural and organizational um, uh, requirements, um, but, you know, they add complexity. You know, and you know, 
with these sorts of distributed services, it's impossible to make synchronous requests over the network behave like local function, uh, functional method calls. That that's just a you know, simple fact. You know, a, a function call within the same process is is you know going to be a lot less error prone as compared to one going over a network to to an endpoint which you know you you don't necessarily know you know how close or how far that is. Um, and, and you know that can that can definitely cause problems, and and it requires a slightly different set of thinking from a developer. Um, often, because of these reasons, often it is better to allow a process to take place asynchronously, i.e., in the background. Now, the, you, there might be um you know uh, there might be room to to make rules for around where you know when to make a call asynchronously and when asynchronously, and I'll, I'll talk about that a, a little bit in the, in the next few slides. Um, Event-driven architectures as a whole is a way to address some of the difficulties with distributed services and microservices architectures by utilizing asynchronous um, communications. On to the next slide. Now, I'm a bit of a history buff, so, so I'm going to take, uh, take you on a, on a very, very short history of application architecture. And this is mostly how I've experienced um, you know, application architecture over you know, the course of my career. Um, everyone will have a slightly different view of it, but, but this is you know, my, my view. Now, once upon a time, life was simple. All right? We had a, a monolith. Right, we had users accessing the monolith with a single relational database. Now, I'm sure any kind of any um, developer, anyone in the software industries who's been around for a little while has had experience with one of these. And and mostly when you build your first app, your first Hello World app, it, you know, it probably looks something like this. Um, and you know. This worked, right? Um, this worked for for quite a while. And, and something I want to kind of highlight is that these the relational database guarantees acid transactions. Now, the main thing uh, which I get out of uh, acid transaction is that you you guarantee um, that the transaction has play it has taken place to update or or you, it hasn't. There's no halfway in between. You know, you don't get a um, an update to the database which has ha half been done and half hasn't. And, and this becomes important um, to to consider with distributed services, as you know, in your traditional monolith, you might have all your data in a single database. But as you move forward, um, as you move forward, that might get spread across. And I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, so when more users were added, this is what we would kind of do in the past. We would have, you know, multiple application services, always accessing the, all accessing the same relational database. Now, something I want to kind of mention here is, you know, relational databases are actually amazing. They've, they've, uh, they, they have allowed applications to scale, you know, much more than, than we probably really thought, um, you know, going back a number of decades. However, because it effectively the way I think of a relational database in this context is that it, it's still a single funnel. Everything needs to go through this single funnel. And and while yes, you can try to make that funnel bigger, you, you kind of reach limits. You know how, and in this case, it's how big is the size of that uh, virtual machine, which is that relational database. There's ways to optimize um, the database. There's you know indexes and and the like, but uh, uh, there's always some some limit. So so if your application or your service grows above a certain size, you will reach the limit of your relational database. And and I highlight here, it does not scale well. Now, it scales well up until a certain point. I guess is my point. Uh, is is my point. Um, so. You know, as we were hitting the the capacity of these uh district of these uh relational databases, um, you know, microservices you know became you know much more popular, and, and you know, microservices you know address technical concerns and also organizational concerns. For now, mostly focusing on those technical concerns, but you know, all superheroes have their kryptonite. Microservices ha have their pros and cons. Now, Microsofts can make things easier. Now, for example, you know, if we're looking at an ordering service, you know, a, a, a retail website, users come in, make their order, and 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 you know, if if this was a monolith, it'll be as per you know the previous diagram, the you know it'll all be done within this monolithical service. But you know, 
because of um, you know scaling uh, problems, the, this organization decided that they needed to create you know a, a payment service. They needed to make these uh, yeah separate services to to run and scale um, and maintain independently. Now. The, the connection between the order service and the payment service is a network call. This would be a REST API, um, most likely. Um, and, it, you know, a network call, as, as I alluded to earlier, you know, is by its very nature different to, to a, um, you know, to a local function call. Um, so, so uh, this is where I'll introduce you to the eight fallacies of distributed computing. So I won't talk about all of these, um, but but you know I'll, I'll kind of highlight a few a few of my favourite ones. Uh, the first one, number one, the network is reliable. Now, as we all know, networks go up and down, right? Um, you know, and uh, the systems we create um, ideally should be resilient to those network um, outages or network issues. Uh, secondly, latency is zero. Um, and so it, it just takes longer. No, no matter what you do, it takes longer to make a network call than it does a, a function call. Um, number four, the network is secure. Right, making a function call, it, you know, you can usually trust that you know, you know, it, it, it's it's a lot more likely to be secure. Um, but a network call, you have to you know take those extra steps around um, the security of the network and, and how you communicate, um, especially considering um, models like zero trust. Um, and also tr number seven, transport cost. Um, you know, th there's cost with network calls, especially if you're kind of going across um, across networks, uh, across uh, regions and zones. Uh, all these are all things which you which need to be considered. And so, so if we kind of extend that um, the the previous diagram I had around uh, the, um, the ordering service, if we extend that out to to what you know. You know a few more services. Okay, um, we we now have um, I've added the you know the order service, so the users come in and make their you know perform their order, um, and this order service needs to integrate with the payment service, an inventory service, a user service, and a fulfillment service. Now, anyone who's worked on a retail shop before is probably used you know, thinking, wow, there, you know, there's a lot more services than just those five. Um, but, but you know, I think that this um, this kind of ordering um, use case is a good demonstration of of how to get to um, um, you know of, you know why why event driven architectures um, can be quite powerful. Now, if if we think about this as a you know these are synchronous calls from the order service to the payment service, inventory service, user service, and fulfillment service. Imagine that if you as a user click on, on the button to say, yep, submit my order. And right then and there, while the, the little, um, your cursor is spinning around, your, the order service has to make a request to the payment to each of these four services. And each of these four services needs to do you know, their work. Now, these requests may be made in parallel, be, may be made one at a time, but ultimately for that order, for the user to see a tick at the end, say, yep, order successful, all four of these services will need to be up and running, will, will need to be performing well. If even one of them is having performance problems at the time, you know, the user's going to see that, the user's going to, you know, get frustrated. So, so I think, um, you know, to me, one of the, you know, this sort of model, you know, is not very resilient um, because, you know, your uptime is dependent on the lowest common denominator, you know, the, the weakest link in the chain. If, if one of your services is having problems, then effectively, um, you know, all of the um, services are having problems. And so uh, event-driven architectures, as I'll go on, is a way to really increase the res resiliency of your, your system. And, and I think that that's the, probably the key word I would take out of this, um, the resiliency. Event-driven architectures is a way to increase your resiliency. Asynchronous communication is usually a better way to communicate. Now, asynchronous communication is the foundation of event-driven architectures. Um, now, just to talk about what Firstly, synchronous communications are um, is you know just you know, I'm, I'm sure you know it all it all makes sense, but it's basically we ask a question, make a request, and and the application being called will process and respond while you wait. Uh, this is your your REST APIs, your, your SOAP request. Um, whereas asynchronous is you, where you ask a question or make a request, and the application being called will process the request when it is ready and will respond at a later time, maybe seconds, minutes, hours, or possibly even days later. 
Now, just, just to talk about some real world examples. Now, you know, uh, making a telephone call, that's a synchronous communication. Um, you know, you, you, you pick up the phone, you dial a number or you know, using your mobile phone. I'm not sure what this ancient thing on the screen is. Um, and you call someone and then you talk it straight away. You might ask, you know, uh, ask them, you know, if they're free for lunch um, or, or whatnot, and you get the response back straight away. Now, a real, real world example of asynchronous connect communication is email. You, you you send an email saying are you free for lunch and when when the person who receives the email is you know ready to, to read that email and respond they will do that in their own time now I want to talk about a, a coffee shop example here now this is kind of once again trying to um, the, the analogy of you know going and getting the coffee um, trying to um, you know relate that to how that works as an event-driven system. So I'm going to imagine that this lady here is ordering a flat white with soy. So she asked the, ca the cashier here for the flat white with soy. He will, he's taken the order and he will process the payment. Now, if this was not a synchron, uh, if this was not an event-driven um, system, what that cashier would then do, it, the cashier would then tell the, the barista to make the coffee and while this person's waiting in front of the queue and blocking any other request, the barista would would then make the coffee while everyone's waiting, twiddling their thumbs, and and then eventually the, the, the coffee will be made and that will get passed back to the customer. But that's not how it usually works when we order a coffee. We, we you know we've all seen that we ask you know we make the payment we and the the cashier will usually write on a lid saying you know, your coffee order, flat white, large flat white with soy. And, and they've kind of got codes um, for, you know, for the different types of coffee and the, the size of the cap indicates, you know, the size of the coffee. Um, and so, and then they pass that lid on to, to the barista. And meanwhile, the, uh, once you've ordered, you know, the, um, you, you'll, you'll go off and wait to the site. Usually you get your phone out and, and you know, check, check uh, Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. Um, and then and then this allows the next person in line to make their order and the, the cashier will repeat this and put another lid um, in the queue to the barista and then the barista will will start making those coffees um, possibly one by one possibly um, batch them up and as they're they're ready the barista will yell out saying coffee's ready um large flat white with soy and sometimes it's got their name on it so so he'll yell out the name and then the, the customer will say, yep, that's mine. Now, uh, I'm hoping you can see that, that this is an asynchronous event-driven system um, because, you know, because there, there's basically cues involved here, um, messages that get sent, um, and then the receiver of those messages can can happen, can process them, you know, when when they're ready. Now, there also is a bit of a synchronous call here um, um, service. You know, when the customer makes the order with the cashier, that's happening synchronously. The order and the payment does happen synchronously, but the the coffee, the creation of the coffee, the fulfillment of the order happens asynchronously. Now. How how is this related to event-driven architectures? Um, now, in most cases, event-driven architectures are broker-centric. That is, asynchronous communications are messaged by a message broker. Um, and so basically, this is something which happens in the middle. Um, so the publisher or client application sends a message to and puts the um, the puts a message on the message broker or event bus um, and then eventually the subscriber or the consumer of that the, of that queue um, will will receive that message now where is the message queue in the coffee shop example now if we think of the cashier as the the client application and the barista as the as the server or subscriber here the the message queue is effectively that that uh, queue of coffee leads which which show um which tell you know which which document all the orders so the flat white with soy the the you know long black uh, cappuccinos or whatever that's the queue in this um, event driven system now events uh, you know a better way to distribute so, so if we kind of extend out that um, ordering service again as an event driven system this is what it may look like so the user will make the order 
and we'll get a response back saying the order's been received. Um, the ordering service has sent a message to, to, to a message queue here. Now, generally in these diagrams, the arrows indicate the flow of um, the flow of data, the direction of the flow of data, whereas the the, the green these are message queues or event buses, and I'll I'll, I'll go into um, what those are, you know, the difference between those a little bit later. Now, I've got the user service hanging off to the side here. Now, for example, the fulfillment service will need to know the user's address. You know, the, the, the address to send the, 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 the product to. And so, you know, thinking about things in a, you know, the, the natural way to do this would be to, to get the fulfillment service as it's, as it's doing its, um, you know, performing its business logic, business processing. It makes a synchronous call to the user service to say, what's the address for, for, for this user to, to, you know, to send out the, the, the product? And, and, and as you can see, this would be a mixing of synchronous um, and asynchronous um, communications. And this would work. And, and in most cases, this would work. But there is another alternative to use an even more kind of uh, event-driven system. One thing that we have here is what, what's uh, sometimes called peer-to-peer -peer event chaining. So imagine the product owner says, well, really, we want to check the inventory before retrieving payment because they were getting too many payment reversals because you know, they wouldn't have enough stock left and then they would have to you know, reverse the payments. Now, what what would be involved here? Um, and if we think about it, that is, there's probably changes to to up to three services to make this to make this change. So, so the payment service. Well, firstly, the inventory service will need to kind of read from the order service event queue. Um, and the payment service will will need to read from the uh, the inventory service event queue. And then the fulfillment service will need to read from the payment service event queue. Now, this is probably not much business logic change, um, but you know, there, there's definitely changes to to three different services for what you know seems like a, a fairly trivial change. Okay, now with those definitions in mind, um, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of you know a few of the different types of event-driven architectures. Now, most of these are not mutually exclusive and can quite often be used side by side. The broker topology, this is sometimes called the um, choreography. So rather than leverage a centralized mediator for orchestrating events and services, services subscribe to channels, execute their business logic, and then publish a new message to which um, other services um, may subscribe. And so the, the analogy here is dance choreography. Now, when, when they, you know, a group of performers are performing a dance, they don't have a, a central person telling them what to do at each time. They are responding to the music, what the other dancers are doing, and, and then they obviously have trained and know exactly, you know, the timing of, of, you know, their moves. So each of the, um, the dancers is basically, um, you know, you know, responsible for their own destiny. They're not recent receiving commands. They're, they're, they're looking at events and around them and they're performing what they need to. Now, the next one is the mediator top, uh, topology, sometimes called the orchestrator or controller. This is where you use a service to control the flow of events and commands between services. Right, and, and this is, um, you know, the analogy here is that um, it's like a conductor in an, in an orchestra. The, you know, the conductor is standing in the middle and he, um, he or she is signaling to each of the musicians, um, you know, when to start playing, what to start playing and the like. Now, I'm not great at music, um, but, um, you know, there, there's a lot of work by that um, conductor to, to control the entire orchestra, to make sure that everyone's coming in on cue and everyone's working in sync. This is, um, you know, similar to the orchestrator service, which is in the middle. Now, this service, you know, can, can be built in a number of different ways. Um, it can be built just with code, but there's also kind of workflow type um, languages and systems um, that can be used. But the, the users, um, if we, if I'm going to walk through this. So the users will, you know, make their order. Um, the order service will respond to the user saying, this is, you know, your order ID, and will send a message to um, this, this uh, message bus or event bus or queue. Now, the orchestrator in the middle receives this, and the orchestrator actually receives, you know, whenever any event occurs, um, it is the one that decides, you know, what needs to happen next. So, 
the the orchestrator will decide okay first i need to you know get a pay um get um get the payment um yeah call the payment service so the orchestrator will actually call the will send the command to the payment service right and and this is this queue here um is just for the payment service and it's it's a command topic effectively um and the response will be sent by this response topic okay and then the orchestrator gets that receives the the response from the payment service and then decides okay i will i now need to call the inventory service and it will once again do this via the, the request and response topics once that's completed it will call the fulfillment service um and it can even call the user service to get extra data as it needed um and and then you know call out to the fulfillment service now one of the powers of this is, you know, as per you know the previous example, I said, what happens if the product owner says, I want to um, check inventory before we make a payment? Now, if you're using the broker topology, that requires changes in you know three or four different services. Whereas if you're using this orchestrator um, topology, um, it only requires a change in the orchestrator. Next one is uh, event sourcing. Uh, whenever we make a change to the state of a system, we record that state um, change as an event and we can confidently rebuild the system state by reprocessing the events at any time in the future. Instead of focusing on the current state, you focus on the changes that have occurred over time. It is the practice of modeling your system as a sequence of events. Now, a couple of examples um, is, you know, your bank, your bank statement. Now, you know, Effectively, your your you know your overall balance, you know yes, there's there's probably a run in total, but you know your bank can you know has stored a record of every single transaction that has occurred, and so it creates the pay, um it can create these um account statements by listing out each transaction and then talking about and then showing your balance and calculating your balance on the fly. Another example of event sourcing is source code repositories. Your source code repositories actually build out, um, you know, don't necessarily, your source code repositories don't necessarily store the latest um, version of the file. They, they often store snapshots, but under the covers, they have a history of every single change that has taken place to every single file. This is a form of event sourcing. Now, if we go back to this original kind of broker topology, um, and this is, I showed you here a bit previously, the fulfillment service making a synchronous request to the user service. Uh, an ordering service with event sourcing would be that whenever a change is made to the user service, um, uh, your record is updated. The user service will send, will you know, create an event, and the fulfillment service will then store its own um, database or copy of all the users. So when the fulfillment service is required to to actually get the user's um, you know, address, it's already got that. And one advantage of this, it can store which you know the fields it requires, and it you know it can store it in a way that works best for for itself. And there's obviously pros and cons with this, um, and and you know you'll need to decide you know which of these uh, you know models works for you. Closely linked to event sourcing is uh, CQRS, Command Query Response Segregation. Um, is, is the notion of having a separate data structure for reading and writing information. Now, I've kind of got this hall of mirrors here to kind of show that, you know, using CQRS, you can have different representations of the data um, for different purposes. And so, so each mirror here is, you know, will, will, will reflect something slightly different back. Now, a really good example of that is around search. You know, uh, tools such as Elasticsearch have made you know searching you know um, large amounts of data a lot easier. And you know, you know yourself as a user when you're searching for a product in a you know an online retail site, the the product um you know you, there's a lot of different fields. There's often free text fields. Um, and but you know the 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 main products are probably stored in a relational database somewhere. And, and that doesn't necessarily scale well with, um, in terms of um, providing a, a good search experience. And so the product service in this case, you know, would send, you know, whenever an update's done, we'll send out an event um, and each of the events um, can be stored in this um, event bus. Um, and then the product search service, you know, for, you know can use um, something like Elasticsearch to store the data in a way which makes sense for it.
So, so effectively, we have the product data being stored twice here, two different representations, but two very different use cases. One for you know users to to make updates to, and one for the your customers to actually you know do searches on. Um, change data capture is one which, which I, I wish I had have known about earlier in my career. Um, is, is basically a solution that captures change events uh, directly from the database and forwards those events to downstream consumers, use, usually a message queue or event bus. Now, so if you think about you know, the order in service and how it had to send a message to the um, event bus, another way to do that would be for the ordering service to just store it to the database and then some way of getting that data out of the database and and this can be um, um, you know an inbuilt agent on the database itself which reads the transaction logs or it can be a, a connector or service and and there's um, you know um, some some common patterns here on, on how to read from that database to put these messages into the event queue and then can be processed. Change data capture is a really good way to, to help um, legacy components get, um, you know, um, integrate them with, with a broader ecosystem and try and you know, build, um, you know, new functionality in new technologies. Uh, because you can start getting the, that data and those events out of those systems with, with minimal change to those systems as well, especially, you know, with legacy components, it can be difficult. Um, and and it's, it's a very um, useful technique. Um, Event-driven architectures, so, so that I've kind of gone through a number of different patterns. Now, just to kind of, you know, step back a little even a little bit further, event-driven architectures at an enterprise level. Now, this is how um, I view, um, you know, using an event streaming platform um, as a central nervous system within an, uh, an enterprise, where you have, you know, uh, you know, you have you know, all sorts of different components, um, you know, integrating with your common event streaming platform across the organization. Um, and, and this sort of thing will normally have to be maintained by a central team. Um, and you'd have, you, you know, things like data ingestion um, and your, your data pipelines, your APIs, services and applications, uh, your data warehouse down here and, and uh, all sorts of other shared services can, can all integrate and, and talk a, a common language in a common way, um, you know, with, with common patterns across an organisation. Um, now, there's a number of uh, platforms um, that can be used and we have, um, firstly, I've kind of used the, the terms message queue and event streaming and event bus kind of, um, you know, um, as the same. There are differences. Um, so a message queue, generally messages are not stored permanently, uh, usually better for um, exactly one semantics. This is where you, you you guarantee the message and it gets delivered only once. Um, usually better in build semantics for error handling, especially related to um, dead letter queues. Uh, event streaming, um, usually better for high volume. Message events can be stored for as long as needed and this enables uh, event sourcing and more options for consuming applications, especially around scaling um, to, to, to high volumes. So some messaging and eventing platforms to consider. Um, so Azure has Event Hub, Event Grid, and Service Bus. Um, there's a number of other open source ones, including RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, Apache Kafka, and Apache Pulsar. And there, there's a number of other um, um, you know, commercial software as well. A special call out to Apache Kafka. Um, that's very much um, taking the lead these days, um, and, and you know that's where the, the biggest community is. Um, and even the the um, is Azure Event uh, Hub, I believe, has a Apache Kafka compatible API. So, so it, you know, I think that's probably the key one to really keep an eye on. All right, now some considerations here. Um, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Is um, don't try and run um, your the your messaging system um, yourself, whether it's Apache, Kafka or the like, use a SaaS or PaaS. And there's good ones um, all, um, all over the place, a lot of good ones on Azure, as men already mentioned. Um, take your time to build a foundation um, and make sure your developers understand and know why um, you know, you're doing things this way. Observability, you know, it becomes a lot harder to follow and understand um, how your system works, you really need to you know build that observability in from from, uh, from the ground up so that when an error happens, when you're trying to figure out what your system is doing, um, that that you can trace a message uh, throughout the you know throughout its flow. 
schema. Basically, you know, when you send a message to a message bus and someone else, um, another service picks it up, um, you know, this is effectively created as your API. You need to have an agreed upon schema for, for every single um, message. And so that way, you, you know, each um, you know, consumer application um, can, can actually process that, that message. Um, generally speaking, I, the default communication type should be asynchronous um, with, uh, with, the, with a kind of couple of caveats there. If a user's clicked the button and waiting, then, you know, you probably want to make it synchronous with, you know, but, but there's still, uh, you know, a few things to decide there. But over time, you should be aiming for, for asynchronous by default unless the use case uh, deems otherwise. Uh, security and authorization. Um, effectively, you have all your data in these queues. You need to make sure it's secure and only the right parties are accessing it. Error management. What happens when an error happens? Um, things um, to think about here are dead letter queues and you know um, the flows for, for these errors. Um, different... Um, Different services have uh, different guarantees around uh, once only message delivery versus at least once. Um, you need to understand the difference. Um, and message ordering. Um, different different queuing systems and messaging bus um, have different guarantees around message ordering. Once again, things you need to understand. Um, so just a quick conclusion is that event-driven architectures make it easier to build decoupled, scalable, reliable, and maintainable services. Now, the word I should probably should have put in, in there is resilient. I think event-driven architectures may help make your solutions a lot more resilient um, to, to issues in, 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 in individual services. Um, it does add complexity to your systems. It makes it harder to observe. Um, you need to decide if this trade-off is worthwhile. Um, you should build your foundational architecture using your chosen event stream or message service. Um, and then you also need to enable all the teams to utilize this service. Um, thanks a lot for that. A really insightful talk about event-driven architectures and the sort of uh, problems that they help solve and some of the challenges there are with them as well. Uh, I did have a question that I did want to ask you off the back of that. So uh, CQRS is a fairly common pattern that's used uh, in event-driven architectures. Um, the question I have is, you know, is there a risk uh, using CQRS that you can end up with different models of data? And if if there is, you know, what are some of the common ways that you can deal with that challenge? Yeah, absolutely. That that's a huge risk, and and I have seen that before, where um, depending on which API or service a customer was using, they got. Um, what effectively looked like different da um, data, uh, even though it was just different representation. So it can be uh, quite a, uh, you know, a poor experience for your customers if that happens. Um, and and look, th th this is one of those things. There's actually no, there's no real easy way to to solve that um, except uh, you know good discipline. Um, I think trying to keep um, you know that data within your domain is very important. Um, so so taking the you know domain driven design approach. You know, you can have, try and have your different represent, representations of that data um, created within your domain. Um, but then when it's exposed outside of your domain, you, you very guardly, very tightly guard how that gets exposed. And the, the team that's responsible for that data should be responsible for exposing that to, um, to any services or systems outside of that domain. Um, but yeah, it is something which you need to be very careful of um, and yeah, can, can definitely cause problems. Okay, good, good to know. Thanks for that. Look, uh, thanks a lot uh, again for that, that talk, uh, Armin. Um, if you're a, a viewer and you want to get more information about the topic covered today, please do, do go and have a look at our show log, which is there on the screen. If you want to catch any of our previous episodes, you can also find them on our episode page there as well. Uh, but we're not done with this episode just yet. Uh, Amit's going to join myself uh, in a moment for live Q&A. So those questions that you've asked or the questions that you haven't asked yet that you still are looking for answers for, please do join us uh, in just a moment. Amit, thanks uh, again, and I'll see you in just a sec. Hey, everybody, and here we are with our live Q&A this morning, and I'm joined by Amit. Good morning, Amit. Good day, Simon. How are you doing? All right. Uh, look, we had a lot of great questions during that episode, and thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. Hopefully, you got a great insight into uh, using event-driven architectures and asynchronous communications in your solutions. Um, let's dive into the questions so we can make the most of this time that we have. Um, 
<clears throat> I did want to acknowledge uh, someone put a, a rather um, vague question of how much do you love Udi and Clemens? And I can only assume that that's uh, Udi Dahan from N Service Bus and Clemens Vasters, who is our chief messaging architect here at Microsoft. Well, it'd be remiss of us not to acknowledge uh, how much we do love folks that build great uh, messaging uh, infrastructure for us uh, and the open source community as a whole. So um, yeah, we do we do love them is the short answer to that. Um, getting on to, I guess, more specifically about the, the topic that, that you've covered today, Amit, um, there's probably a couple of questions that go together uh, here. Just looking, um, you know, there was a question around um, you know, what's a great way to publish events um, in an event driven architecture and have other users inside a network subscribe, you know, through tools like Power Automate? And then I think the related question is, um, you know, my BI developers don't like my event driven architectures. They don't like the fact that I have, you know, 100 databases uh, and not one monolithic database. Um, and any advice on to handle that, how to handle that relationship? So I think. You know, what's your thoughts on those those two questions uh, around publishing events and then obviously consuming uh, data from a database in that scenario? Well, one of the great things about event driven architectures is that um, when you have all the events, you know, tr going through your central message broker or event stream, um, it's really up to you what you can do with them after that. Um, so, so a great thing to do um, is basically start reading that those events and putting them into a form which works for you. Um, and so, I think both these questions kind of, uh, you know, you know what they're alluding to is is putting these events or all your data into a, a data warehouse, an appropriate data warehouse, which you can then consume in any way. So especially for the BI developers, um, you know, BI developers, yes, you know, I've been there where, you know, your, your data and analyst BI developers, you know, are having to connect to, to many different databases, which is not a good experience for them. It will slow them down. But using event-driven architectures, and, and, you know, this, this really is a problem not just with event-driven architectures, but any sort of distributed um, um, system. Uh, but event-driven architectures allows you to address this uh, by effectively funneling all your data into a centralized data warehouse um, or you know of your choice and then not just your bi developers but your data analysts your your ai ml teams your data scientists can start utilizing this data and really getting great insights um, and you know connected to power automate um, you know, it's all about the connectors. You know, e each of the the message buses or, or um, event stream services will have different sets of connectors. Um, and especially, you know, if you're staying within the, for example, the Microsoft world, um, you know, it makes it a lot easier to be connecting, you know, uh, one Microsoft system to another, and another such as Power Automate. So, being able to connect the, um, you know, those systems, you know, is a lot easier. Um, and yeah, event driven architectures just makes that all a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Uh, the subscription to those events as well, right? You know the the idea of a trigger in a in a in a Power Automate flow or in an Azure Logic App uh, makes it much easier to subscribe to events in an event driven architecture. So for me, you know that's that's part of the go to um, you know in that space. Um, there was a couple of questions uh, around you know a, can, a, a canonical um, event source pattern for Azure, and then there was also another question around. You know, what's the difference between event hubs, service bus and event grid? Um, well, I'm pleased to say for those these two questions is if you go to the show notes, uh, you'll find uh, a link that points to the Azure Architecture Center where we cover uh, design patterns as they relate to event driven architectures. And it does go into quite a lot of detail. So there's obviously not a one size fits all approach to this as, as you've seen from Amit's talk today. So you obviously need to think about the uh, the pattern that you're going to use to solve the the business problem that you have and then find the appropriate uh, architectural pattern and how to implement it in Azure. So it definitely does exist there. Uh, and then the, there's a fairly common question around the you know, difference between eventing and messaging. And then in Azure, what's the difference between the different services uh, in that space? Again, the show notes have a link uh, out to a great blog post from uh, Clemens Vasters, uh, who covers some of that. And Microsoft Docs also has some really good content that goes into what's the difference between messaging and eventing, uh, and then how to use the different services and the different sorts of scenarios that you might use them in. Um, and then I'm just going to quickly touch on uh, one other question, and then I'll, I've got a couple more, I think, that we'll see if we can get through uh, in this block. Uh, we had a question around, you know, Azure Functions. Um, it's probably less less event driven um, in this context, but, you know, event an event uh, Azure Function, which I'm assuming has an HTTP 
uh, endpoint that's returning a custom status code um, and they want to provide access to it through an API gateway um, but looking at Azure API management they feel like it's a bit of a um, a sledgehammer to a crack or a peanut uh, type, type scenario. Uh, and I think the answer here is it really depends what you're trying to achieve. So Azure Functions do have a thing called uh, Azure Functions proxies, which can be used to simplify the routes uh, people use to consume your HTTP endpoints inside of Azure Functions. But if what you're looking to do extends beyond uh, basic authentication um, and URL rewriting, then you really are into the world of API management at that point. Um, and you don't have to use all the features of API management. You can literally just proxy your endpoint, um, push the, the incoming request straight through to the back end and push the response from the back end straight out to the consuming apps. Oftentimes what we will see people using API management for is they have a legacy API that doesn't have the idea of multiple users um, and the ability to do things like throttling uh, and access control on that API and they don't want to bake it in. That could be the case in this scenario with the Azure function. In that case, you can use API management and use the policy based approach to doing that. Yes, it is uh, fairly heavyweight, but um, once you start working with it, you'll you'll quickly get to grips with working with policies um, and it's a really quick and easy way to even build synthetic APIs that you may not necessarily have provisioned yet. So that's probably uh, very specific um, to that scenario. So I'm just having a look here at a couple of other questions. So we'll see how we go. Um, there was a question, I don't know specifically what it related to, but um, don't you need out of band reconciliation processes to detect loss events? I mean, to me, that sounds like the answer is probably yes, but I, I'm, I'm interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yep, um, where I think this might be related to is if you're trying to, um, if there's a system and an event occurred, um, you know, one pattern, and I think it's a bit of an anti-pattern actually, uh, one anti-pattern is first to write that um, event to its own database, the service provider to its own database, and then, you know, continue on the process, will then um, write that to a message bus or event queue. Um, and now th there is always a possibility that some error occurs between those two to actions because they're, they're not done in what you know an atomic way um, where there's you know the server dies or you know network issues um, but there, there's always that possibility and so one way around this um, is is this out of bands um, you know cycle or process to, to monitor so the idea would be that um, the, the database is monitored um, and you know if 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 it detects uh, something happened which you know, an event wasn't created for, it can then, you know, create the event. Um, but what I would say is, you know, it's definitely worthwhile considering in this scenario, the change data capture, um, which effectively does that that second piece, but it does it for all the events. Um, and, and yeah, I, I feel like especially, um, yeah, that sort of uh, pattern, you know, the change data capture is very powerful because it always pro provides a single chain of events um, and, you know, a single path, um, you know, always atomic events, right? So you won't end up in this situation where where you kind of, uh, where half of the event, ha you know, was saved, but it wasn't created on the queue or something like that. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, and actually looking at the, the other question we had here, which was around uh, dead letter queues, I think it's probably you know, related to that. Um, there's a great video uh, actually from Clemens uh, earlier in this year where he talks about the architecture of uh, messaging services inside of Azure. And I think, you know, the the durability and reliability of our platform when it comes to to certainly messaging and eventing um, is is substantial. You're up in sort of the 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 four nines, five nines sort of category for durability of messages. So, you know, the chances that you'll lose a message or an event are pretty are pretty low. Uh, that's not to say it can't happen depending on how you've implemented your consumers um, and what you're doing with those messages or events once you grab them. Um, but ultimately, depending on what you're trying to achieve, you know, the durability and reliability of the underlying infrastructure is there. It's just a matter of how you want to manage that yourself. And dead letter queues exist for a reason. They exist for a reason to allow you to you know, deal with messages or events that couldn't be processed. Uh, and actually, I think it brings us to the last question around as well, which was um, like cyclical events where events get stuck in a, you know, one event has a relationship to another event, which has a relationship back to the same event. Um, to me, that sounds like a, a problem that's solved by dead letter queues, but happy to to hear your thoughts on this armor and we'll, we'll look to wrap it up after after this question.
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but you know, even with the letter Qs, uh, depending on the process you decide to to address the the um, you know what ends up in the dead letter Q, um, it could end up a bit cyclical. Even if you have a automated process to to try and address it, where you don't actually address it appropriately. Um, and, and look, I, I think you know the. You know the ways to address that would be to to you know include some sort of uh, kind of counter on the message. Um, so when you do play put it back into the original queue, you can then say, well, if this has failed again, um, you know you can increment that fail count, and so that your automated processes in the dead on the dead letter queue uh, would would kind of say, well, I've already tried to do this. Um, I'm not going to try to do this again. Um, and and you might have a, even a, a secondary. Um, 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 you know, me method of of uh, oh well, most likely it would be a manual uh, manual process to to address that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Armit, look, thank you very much once again for joining us on today's show. I can see we've got uh, a stack of questions that we haven't had time to get to, unfortunately. But what we will do is um, we'll go through those questions after today's episode. Uh, we'll find answers to them and we'll update the show notes with a link to a Q and A document. So. Please do check out the show notes. That link's been in chat a few times today, um, and that will be where you'll be able to find that out. So um, let's go ahead and wrap up the show. Amit, thanks a lot again, and we'll speak to you later. Yes, thanks, Simon. It's been great. All right, folks. So uh, that is it for today's New Breakpoint episode. Uh, we do have another great show that will be coming up uh, in November. Um, if you are interested to hear about an opinionated approach, approach to doing uh, GitOps, uh, with Kubernetes and making the most of your investment in Kubernetes and you want to understand how you can do that using uh, Red Hat OpenShift um, and doing it with uh, Azure Red Hat OpenShift, which is our managed Red Hat OpenShift service on Azure. Keep an eye out for that. The registration page will go up for that in the next couple of weeks. Um, it'll be at the same location that you may have registered for today's event at, so check back uh, in a little while. Um, again, thanks a lot for joining us for today's show and I will see you at the next one. Bye for now.